here. If you got a Bible, open to Psalm 23. And, um, you know, I was telling Pastor Mike earlier in the first service, I'm going to preach a word today that I believe is really an ordinary day moment for this church. Um, the more stories I'm listening to, um, the more things that are happening in our world, there's a lot of need, a lot of struggle in the world. In this room right now, I'm not, I'm not going to soft coat it. In this room, there's a lot of struggle in this room. Um, I myself are dealing through a lot of struggle. I'm dealing with right now, personally, someone in my life who's very close to me, who has direct influence in my life, who's been struggling with 20 years of addiction um, and is in rehab and possibility of relapsing. Like, it's bad. You know, I'm, I'm seeing these things happen, um, you know, in my own family. Um, I've gone through heartache. This, this message comes out of pain. It doesn't come out of, it comes out of victory, amen, in Jesus, but it also comes out of pain. And so I say all that to say to you that it's an ordained moment that you're here this morning. You did not come here to sit in a seat and get a good education. You came here for transformation. You came here to like experience Jesus in the room, right? Jesus in the room. And there's no doubt your pastor, my friend, my best friend, there's no doubt that the Lord has anointed him. But listen at this, the church is not built on a man. It is not built on a woman. The, the church is built on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And your pastor want me to hear you say that. And though he's not here, Jesus is here. And Jesus has a word for you. And it's an ordained moment for you. And I believe that. So Psalm 23, if you know, anybody know Psalm 23? Yeah, uh, now, how many of you know Psalm 23? Okay, how many of you have, have, have maybe, you, maybe you don't really know Psalm 23, you've heard of Psalm 23, you heard it at a funeral. How many of you seen like on a, I don't know, you're, anybody got a picture of Psalm 23 in their house, like on the wall? I won't judge you, I promise. Anybody's mama and grandmother have that picture? You know what I'm talking about? It's that Jesus with the nice like combed hair and, you know, looked like he just, you know, went to, you know, Middle Eastern H&M, you know, that kind of thing, you know, like, you, you know what I'm talking about, that picture, right, right, Jesus petting the lamb, you know, anyways, I'm not judging you if you have that, um, a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but Psalm 23 is an amazing passage, because most of us say we know Psalm 23, but when I knew you were doing this series, that hits different, my question was, is do you know Psalm 23, and I'm praying that this message will hit different with you, that you won't check out on me because you can recite this, or part of this text, but that you'll allow this text, the Lord will use this moment in your life to give you a word. How many of you know God has a word for you today, amen? He has a word for you. He wants to speak to you. So I don't care how many times you've read it. I don't care how many times you think you know it. Just listen that God has a word in this text for you today. And I believe that, okay? I believe that. So in order to understand Psalms, I gotta give you some context. You have to know when you're studying the book of Psalms, you have to know that the Psalms were not written in some kind of chronological order, okay? So that means... Psalm 3 didn't necessarily come after Psalm 2 or Psalm 4 before uh, Psalm 5. So they're not written in chronological order. However, Psalm 22, 23, and 24 actually paint a beautiful picture that go together, okay? So what's Psalm 22 about? Psalm 22 is about affliction. It's about somebody that's struggling with affliction, struggles in their life. It's a picture of, the, of really of, of the forecoming of the crucifixion of Christ and the affliction that Christ would go through himself. And then you see at the end of 22, you see this idea of a kingdom, right? Because of affliction, of, of having victory of affliction, this, this, you have this, this idea of kingship, if you will. Then you jump Psalm 23 and you get into Psalm 24. And the whole Psalm of 24 is about this, is living in this kingdom, right? So what's Psalm 23 about? Psalm 23 is a bridge. It's a bridge between affliction and victory. It's a bridge between affliction and the kingdom of God. It's really a picture of Christianity, that through the power of Christ in us that we're called to be kingdom people. You know, we hate this in America because, you know, we, we, um, we live in a republic, amen? Praise God for it. The problem is the Bible wasn't written in a republic. The Bible was written in a monarch. It's a kingdom. You with me? And there's a king, and we don't get a vote in it, right? There's a king, and what he says goes, and there's a, there's a, a future reign, but get this. The kingdom of God is not something that we get to future experience. The kingdom of God is the reality today. Jesus said, Jesus said, he says, pray that the kingdom would come where? On earth as it is in heaven, right? So it's not that we get saved so we'll fly away one day and meet Jesus face to face. No, the reality is that God has saved you today. And the more that the people experience the church, the people of Christ who have the Holy Spirit of God in you, we're, experience, we're people of the kingdom, right? We're experiencing the kingdom. That's why the church has to plant. That's why we have to grow. That's why we have to multiply. Because where we go, the kingdom goes. Amen? Because we have a king that's directing us. So that's what's happening in 22, 23, and 4, is we're experiencing affliction. 
Like, are we people of the kingdom? Yes, but we still have one foot in this world. And so we kind of, in some ways, are experiencing this kingdom and his kingdom, right? We're, we're kind of straddling it. And I don't know about you, but when I'm experiencing affliction and pain in my life, can I be honest with you, in my human ability, I tend to lean over on the left side towards my own kingdom. I start to have fears. I start to have anxieties. Everything we sang about this morning, right? I have to remind myself that I'm not a person of this kingdom, that I have a king that has a kingdom that's already going to happen, that already is happening. And I'm a person of that kingdom. But Psalm 23 is a bridge that says, this is the bridge between how to live in affliction and how to live in our victory at the same time. How to live in the middle, if you will. That's why I love it. It's sandwiched between those two things. It's how to live in the middle of our affliction. Psalm 23 is really about how Jesus followers are to find contentment, peace, courage in the face of some of life's biggest pains and uncertainties. Biggest pains and uncertainties. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Some of you need that today, amen? You all need that today. Some of you listening online need that today. You're facing something in your life that feels like death. You're facing something in your life that is not your plan. And you need to know, Pastor Josh, how do I live in the middle? How do I live in the middle in the midst of so much chaos around me? And that's what Psalm 23 is all about. So if you've got a Bible or a phone, scroll, I don't care, whatever, whatever you've got there in front of you, it's going to be on the screen as well if you don't have it. But like Walk Church always does so well, if you're ready to get a word from God today, say, let's eat. Let's eat. We're going to eat from the Word of God. Here's Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. It says this, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. shepherd. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He what? He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with who? Me. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, you anoint my head with oil, my cup it just overflows and maybe goodness and mercy shall follow me is that what it says it says surely it's a done deal though i have affliction in my life though i'm struggling right now though i walked in walk church this morning wanting to hear a good sermon but you don't know what i'm going through pastor josh you don't know the struggle that i'm in god says to you surely it's a done deal. Goodness and mercy for my children, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Done deal. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the confidence of your word. I pray, Lord, it would just rest on these people's lives. And Lord, it would go the 18 inches from the head to the heart. And we see life change happen today. God, we did not come for education. We came for transformation. God, we need you this morning. We want to experience your presence. There's nobody in the history of the world that's ever come into your presence and walked away not changed. That's the reality. Nobody, God, has ever come and not walked away un unchanged. Either changed for the glory and for the good, Lord, or walked away from you and turned their back on you. But the reality is, Lord, that everybody experiencing you has to make a choice. Lord Jesus, and I pray this morning that choices we've made, faith will be given, life will be changed, and that nobody in here mistakes the lie from Satan that they're here by accident. This is a word strictly to every single person here. And all God's people say, amen, amen, amen and amen. Well, hey, how many of you growing up did some crazy things in your life and you look back 10, 20 years later and you think, I can't believe I'm still alive. Anyone? Yeah, you know those? It gets worse when you have kids, right? Because you know what they're going to experience, right? Right? In the Bible, there's some amazing stories of everyday people like you and I who are doing extraordinary things. Sometimes, uh, we'll say, well, don't make the greatest decisions in the world, but God always uses it. Sometimes he just takes ordinary people with faith and does extraordinary things, amen? In fact, just for fun, what are some of those stories of the Bible? Maybe you're new to church, you don't know. Maybe you're online, you don't know some of these stories of the Bible. Maybe I could just give you some. We could give you some to, to maybe go back and read. What are some of those amazing stories of the Bible that you read as a kid, maybe 
uh, where God took extraordinary, did, uh, took ordinary people, did extraordinary things. Just throw some out real quick. Daniel, Joseph, and, and jo- Joseph, David and Goliath. Who else? Jonah. Ooh, Jonah is a, a great one. Don't read Jonah if God's telling you to do something. Stay away from that one. What, what else? Mary, right? Esther, Ruth, Naomi, right? Amazing stories. I mean, everyday people. In fact, what's crazy is take Elijah, the, the person who called fire down from heaven. The book of James says that Elijah was an everyday, ordinary person like you and I. David, the very Psalm that we're reading about today. David, the man who wrote many of the Psalms, including this one, the guy who God called a man after his own heart was a person just like you, a person just like me. And I think what makes these people so different than you and I, don't miss this, was not that there was something special about them. It's that they seemed to have faith about them that resulted in some incredible, extraordinary things. It's that they believed a God who was more than themselves is they believe the songs that you sang earlier, right? That what Bashan says, and we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the maker of the heavens and the earth, God himself. The reality is, is these stories are supposed to leave us in awe. The problem is, is if you've been in church very long, you seem to, we tend to graduate from these stories and we, start, we stop talking about them. We start to see them as kid stories instead of stories that move us to awe. That if God could do that in their life, Surely, in the midst of my struggle, he could do it in my life. And that's what these stories are supposed to mean. And so David gets here and he gets down to, the, to Psalm, one, Psalm 23, verse 1. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. The image of a shepherd is used very strategically here. In the ancient world, the word, the, the word shepherd was a, a picture of a king. A king. So it's actually, it could be better, better translated, the Lord is my king. He's my king. But shepherd is used very strategically. The Lord desired that shepherd be used because he's speaking to you this morning that yes, he is a God who created the heaven and the earth, but he's a personal God that knows you, who created you. He knows everything about you. He knows every affliction in your life. He knows every struggle that you're going through online. He knows this. And he says, the Lord is my king, yes, but he's my shepherd. And because he's my shepherd, the God of the universe, who can take ordinary things and do extraordinary, who can take nothing and create something, that God, the, the, the maker of all things, knows you. Like, that's crazy. He knows your name. He knows your thoughts. He knows everything about you. You know what's crazy? I didn't say this in the first service, so you, this is a bonus. What's crazy is he knows everything about you and still yet loves you. That's crazy. Everything, nothing is hidden before him and he still loves you. So David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And if he's my shepherd, how could I want? How could I want? He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You know why that's important? Sheep don't lie down naturally. Sheep don't lie down unless they're content, unless they're well-fed and getting along together. They don't lie down. So he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. How can I want? In fact, it's like he makes my anxiety lie down. He makes my depression lie down. He makes my worry and my concern and my affliction that I'm struggling right now lie down. It's like when I experience the presence of God and I think about the God of the universe who can just make things happen, I realize to myself, the fact that he knows me and knows what I'm intimately going through and loves me, that thought makes me lie down. It's like lying down in green pastures. He says, he says it's like he leads me beside still waters. How many of you have grew up, I, for me, how many of you like to be outside and outdoors? Like to camp, that sort of thing? I'm really sorry. I used to tell our church, in Portland all the time, uh, camping was huge there. And I used to tell them all the time, I'd say, I'd say, you know, I really love like Four Seasons, like the hotel. Um, and I'm, I'm like the spa camping in, I don't know, so much for me. But, um, but, but that's cool if you like it. I grew up in the outdoors. I'm from the mountains of East Tennessee. So you grew up, heard about the Appalachian Mountains. Your teachers taught you wrong. 
It's called the Appalachian Mountains. We're Appalachian people. That's who I am. My people are mountain people, right? So moonshine, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. And uh, that's how we, that's, that's my people. That's my people. So, so it's all right. And uh, we do have shoes and we do have education. It's amazing. So just let y'all know that. But listen, but I grew up in the mountains. But when you're in the woods, I just went to Mount Charleston, took my kids to Mount Charleston. Beautiful place, right? Amazing. We just went up there. And, um, and we're up in a place called Deer Creek, having a picnic. And, and it's just peaceful. There's nobody there. And there's a stream coming down the middle of Deer Creek, right? And it's literally a creek, <laughs> you know? It's little creek, right? Coming to, and the sound is just so peaceful, you know what I'm saying? So what David is saying, he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. How could I want anything else? It's, it's like he, he, he makes me lie down. It makes my anxiety lie down. In fact, it's almost like, he's, it's almost like I'm walking beside still waters. I mean, the, the world is crazy. I'm struggling with an affliction right now. I have addiction in my life. I'm struggling with massive things. I, have, I feel like there's no way out, but it's weird. It's like when I'm in the presence of God, when I'm reminding myself that he's my shepherd, it's almost like the world stops and it's like I'm in a, beside still waters. It's like it refreshes my soul. I'm preaching, Pastor Mike. Anybody hear me? It's like, it's like, you know what I'm talking about? Everything seems chaotic. It's like, I don't wake up and think, how can I fix this? I wake up and I say, I can't do this. And the Lord, you are my shepherd. How can I want anything else? You make me lie down. You lay my anxiety down this morning. In fact, it's weird. I still have my problem, but it's like I'm walking beside still waters. There's so much noise, but I'm restored right now. David says, all I want is to know you and walk with you. You satisfy my soul. You say, Pastor Josh, how do, I, how do I know if he's restoring my soul? How do I know that? Because when you deal with affliction in your life, the question is, where do you first go? If Jesus restores your soul, if he's really restoring your soul, you're gonna keep going back for more. If you're going to fix your problems outside of Jesus, you're gonna find nothing. You will not restore your soul. It's when you go to Jesus, he restores your soul. And he leads, or he guides the list. David says, he leads me in the path of righteousness for whose namesake? His namesake. It doesn't say for your namesake. Because listen, because God's will for your life is solid. What this tells me is that he leads me along the path that's best for him and his namesake. Meaning this, there's nothing, no sickness, no affliction, no struggle, no disease, no bad doctor's report, no wayward child. There's nothing that comes into your life that did not pass through a sovereign hand of God who has a purpose for your life. Nothing. He can take anything and use it because he's leading you to the path, on his path, from the right path for his name's sake. He has a plan and purpose for your life. You better write this down. You don't have to know God's will for your life if your confidence in God's word on your life. You don't, you don't have to know why God's allowing something if you know that. Because you know that the Lord is your shepherd. He's personal. And he's leading you around the right path. Because your life is meant for something more than ourselves. It's for his kingdom, for his name's sake. And he's gonna use you. Everybody says, I wanna be used. I want, I want my life to count for something. Then know that your life will only count, listen, in eternity through the kingdom of God, through knowing King Jesus, because he's leading you on the right path of eternity. He's leading you for you, for him in your life. Remember, listen, God's ultimate dream for your life is that you know him and depend on him because depending on him leads to the right path. I love Psalm one. 31, one and two, David says, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. You know what David's saying? He's saying, I stopped asking why a long time ago. If you know David's life, it was a life full of affliction. 
It was a life full of failure. It was a life of sin. It was a life of struggle. And yet he says, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Do not occupy, listen, I do not occupy myself with things too great. I stopped asking why or what are you doing? Did you know that self-pity, why me, actually leads you to a black, dark hole? It leads you to places you don't want to go. Because, listen, self-pity says, why me, I deserve more. The gospel says, I deserve nothing, but I'm royalty. That's what the gospel says. The gospel says, I don't deserve to sit at the feet of Jesus. I don't deserve to sit at the table, but he made me a son or a daughter and gave me a seat at the table. That's what it means. You're royalty. You're a king, you're a daughter, you're, you're, I'm sorry, you're a son, you're a daughter of a king. That's why you can sing, I'm a child of God. Remember that. He's my shepherd. He makes my anxiety lie down because I'm a child. And he's leading me. He's allowing things in my life for his name's sake. I believe that to be true. John Bloom said it like this, living in the will of God is more about resting in his sovereignty than resting with ambiguity. That's a promise, a promise from God that we can trust him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not, y'all know this, right? Do you know it? Do not what? Lean on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him, his right path, and he will make your straight, straight your what? Path, he will make straight your path. It does not say you shouldn't have plans for your life. It says you don't lean on your plans. He says, you don't put your life on your plans. You know why? Here's what I found out. My plans never work out. Ever. I got plans, people. I got plans. I was planning yesterday to start working out. Didn't happen. I ate peach cobbler last night. It was amazing. My plans never work out. But his plans will make straight your path. Don't lean on your own understanding. John Piper says, when God's, listen, when God's direction and purpose for us are unclear, his promises are crystal clear. You know why it's important to get up and read the word every day? It's not because God will love you more. Listen to me. God loves you unconditionally, fully. In fact, he loves you as much a day as he will a thousand years in heaven because your salvation and his love for you is not based on what you do. It's based on who he is. And so you don't get up and read the word because some religion tells you, you gotta know God, it's how you know God. That's how you, get the, that's how you get a relationship with God. No, you get a relationship with God by putting your faith in Jesus and trusting him for everything, amen? That's how you get, that's, that's how you get to know God. But the reality is, is I read the word, not so God will love me more. I read the word because I do love him. And I, listen, I read the word because I need to be reminded that the Lord is my shepherd. That what I'm struggling with right now does not define me. I messed up this week, but it doesn't define me. He defines me. The bad doctor's report doesn't define me. He will define me. The affliction, the struggle, the addiction does not define me. He will define me. And the reason you word, read the word is to remind yourself of the promises of God. Like Romans 8, 28, in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's a promise. Verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no what? Evil. For you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When you read this text, you've heard it at a funeral, I'm sure. Bad context, and I'll tell you why. The valley of the shadow of death is an actual place. So when David's talking about the valley of the shadow of death, he's speaking of a very real experience of walking through a place that was known as a very hostile, dangerous place. It was a place where much affliction happened. It was a place that if you walked through, you were lucky to get out of it. You were lucky to get out of it. It's where people were murdered, people were thieves. It was a very dangerous, scary place. And he says, even though I walk through the ravine of the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil, why? for you are with me and your rod and your staff protect me because you are my shepherd. How can I want? You make me lie down. I'm walking through the valley and you're like resting my anxiety. In fact, it's like I'm walking 
like I'm on a stream right now. I'm walking through something very difficult, Pastor Josh, but it's like I'm walking along a stream. I'm so refreshed, and I know Jesus is for me because he's leading me down the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm just not going to fear it. Because I know you're with me and you'll protect me. Now, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, for most of us, we spend most of our life begging and asking God not to go through the ravine. For most of our lives, we struggle with tension. But can I be honest with you? Some of the greatest, most deepest treasures in your life, in your relationship with God, will not be found on the outside of the ravine. Will actually be found in the inside of the ravine. They will actually be found in some of the darkest struggles of your life. Jesus is with the broken. Jesus is in the struggle. Jesus is not waiting on the outside. He's in the bottom. Christianity is not, do I, how much can I climb out? Christianity is let go of the rope and meet Jesus in the bottom. That, that's, that's the Jesus of the Bible. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking David's saying this. If God does some of the greatest work and most intimate, how many of you know knowing God is different than knowing God? You know that? It's different. How many of you know, listen, I think David is saying, you know what? It's not humanly possible for me to want necessarily go to the ravine, but here's the thing. What I know because he's leading me down the path of his, for his name's sake, when I walk through those dark days of my life, I'm assured of this, that he is with me and that he will protect me based on his name's sake. And the reality is this, is that if I really want to know God more deeply, maybe I have to walk through the valley, the shadow of death to experience it. Because listen, knowing God will provide for you is different than knowing God will provide for you when you have nothing. Knowing God will heal you is different than when you walk through a bad doctor's report and he heals. It's different when you say, I need prayer, I need help. And then you pray and you watch God move because then you know prayer works. Are you with me? It's different knowing than knowing. And he's saying, listen, I'm thinking we spend all of our time praying people out of tension when sometimes God's allowing the tension to do the greatest deeper work in your life. Some of you are like, man, I, I, I just went out of this. I'm saying, look at Jesus' face in it. You're missing the treasure in it. When I went to plant a church in Portland, Oregon, if you'd have told me we had to walk through some of the deepest, darkest days of our life to experience some of the hardest things of our life, I wouldn't have went because I don't like tension. I don't like struggle. I don't like betrayal. I don't like hurts. I'm preaching to you this morning because I walked through a ravine. I'm preaching to you this morning because I've, I've not just, I don't just know this text, I know this text. Because I woke up many mornings thinking, I don't know if I can do this. I once heard a, a, a guy once tell me, he said, Josh, you wanna follow Jesus? I said, yeah. He'd say, welcome to betrayal. Welcome to pain. Welcome to affliction. Here's the problem. It doesn't grow the American church because you don't wanna hear that. But the reality is, is God, listen, the God of the universe knows and he has a path for you and he has to take you through that to do something deeper in your life so that one day you can stand in a living room, sit at a coffee shop, sit at a cubicle at work, stand on a stage at Walt Church and say, listen, God has not forgotten you. God, God is with you. You don't feel it. You're not your feelings. You're, listen, you don't have to know why because you can know his word and his promises are true and they're for you. He's with you. So though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I'm not gonna fear any evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. I love Psalm 119, 71. David says, it is good for me to be a what? Afflicted. Afflicted. Say what? He just said that. It's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statues. It's good that I walked through this. It's good that my plan didn't work out so that I may know you. Verse five, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. This is so good. 
He says, our enemies are so defeated. David says, listen, I have so much victory in this affliction right now. In fact, I'm so restored. I feel like I'm walking beside still waters. My anxiety is laid down. In fact, it's like God prepared a table and I'm feasting right in front of my enemy's face. I'm feasting right in front of my fear. I'm feasting and saying, you don't own me. I'm, I'm, I'm feasting in front of it saying, I'm sitting at the Lord's table and I'm royalty and it defines me. My struggles do not define me, he defines me. And it looks it right in the face. And it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, bro, I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm just eating my turkey leg. I'm feasting in front of it. I won't fear nothing. You prepare a table for my enemies. Proverbs 28, one says, the wicked flee, no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as lions. Romans 8, 37 says, knowing all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor anything else in creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You see, church, Satan don't want you to believe that. He wants you to waller in your self-pity. He wants you to say, only me. He wants you to say, I'm alone. He wants you to say, if only people knew they wouldn't love me. He says, I know, and I love you. He says, I know, and I'm with you. I know it's in your life. I know your struggle. I feel your pain. I know. I love how David finishes the Psalm. He says in verse six, you anoint my head with oil. So amazing. It's a picture of protection and my cup overflows. Anybody a sheep herders in the room? Anybody sheep herders? Didn't think so. I don't think we had that in Vegas. Um, I'm not either, so you don't know if I'm telling the truth or not. But, uh, but sheep herders, here's what I know. Here's what I think I know. It's a, a shepherd would pour oil on a sheep's head. You know why? You know, I love the Bible. It, the Bible actually, uh, it, it gives us the picture that we're sheep, which is so funny. You know, sheep are not smart animals, right? right? So, so they're like the dumbest animal in the world. So, so sheep, He's saying the sheep, what would happen is a sheep would, they would, uh, they'd get bugs and they would, they'd get annoyed, you know, with the bugs and itchy and they don't have hands to like scratch their head, right? So what they do in this context, very rocky area. So a sheep would literally go scratch their head up against a rock. And if it was bad enough, the sheep would bang its head against the rock so many times it would actually kill itself. It actually, it actually burst its brain out of its head because it's itching so bad. Tell me this is not a human being that we literally keep doing the same thing that's killing us. And he's saying, the Lord is anointing you with oil. Can I tell you something? Hear me, listen to me. The thing that's gear in your life right now, the affliction that you find yourself in, I know you see it as a problem, but just maybe, maybe, because your future home is not here, And I'm not saying that you're not walking maybe through a a terminal illness. But the reality is, is you might not be healed here, but there's a promise for you that you will there. And the reality is, is maybe the very thing he's, he's doing in your life isn't about hurting you, it's about protecting you. You're like, wait, what? You don't know what you don't know. It may be God's doing something in your life to actually protect you. When I was going through some massive betrayal in my life, y'all know, some, y'all know this, right? It's, it's Jesus had the closest people to him betraying. So you think you're, you think you're better? You're gonna experience this. Hey, follow Jesus, this is what it's like. You're gonna have somebody betray you. And the reality is this, is that maybe God allowed it because he wanted to do something deeper in you and to protect you from something. And you're like, I can think of 70 other ways to do it, God. Who are we to say that to God? The God of the universe. And he says, I anoint your head with oil. Now get this. He says, it's like my cup overflows. My cup overflows. What do you mean by that? When I was, um, uh, years ago, I did some mission work in, uh, in China, back in the rural villages of China with a people called the Alcaw people. And um, we, would, we would be up in these villages and 
it was interesting. You walk into these homes and they would, they'd, you'd walk into these homes and they would uh, give us tea because that's what they do, custom. So what I learned really slowly is I learned the more I drink the tea, the more they fill it up, right? So the, the key is, and it was, it, was, it was not good. I don't want to offend anybody. It was just not good. So you're drinking this stuff and I started realizing, wow, the faster I drink it, the more they feel it. The faster I drink it, the more they feel it. So I just stopped drinking it really fast and I would just sip, right? Here's the point. What David is saying this is that you will never exhaust the mercy and grace of God in your life. You'll never say, God, how much is too much? How many times are you gonna, how many times are you gonna put up with me? God, I'm walking through this affliction and I doubt you every day. In fact, Satan is sent right now attacking some of you and saying, you don't have faith like that. You doubt him every day. And I'm saying, even in your doubt, God says, I know, but I still love you. Yeah. And there's more mercy every day for you. Every day. Grace every day for you. You can never exhaust me every day. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> how, how can I want it? It's like he makes my anxiety and depression and my fears today lie down. It's like he restores me because it's like I'm walking along still waters and it's still crazy, Pastor Josh, but I can say the Lord is good because he's leading me along the path for his name's sake. And it's so powerful because it's like him feasting before my enemies. I'm feasting before the very thing that looks like it's killing me because here's the thing, it's actually just a shadow of death. It's like a shadow because I know he has a plan and purpose in my life. And I'm secure in him. And he anoints my head with oil. He's using all things in my life for my good. All things. He's the greatest Tetris player in the world because he just connects it all. And he's just working it all for your good, for his glory. And it's like, even when I fail, <laughs> which is a lot, and even when I doubt, he wakes me up the next day and he says, Josh, I got new mercies for you today, son. Just look to me. I'm your shepherd. I know you. I love you. I'm for you. And I love how he ends. It's a word for somebody. Listen to this. He says, surely, for sure, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. That's what he said. That's what he said. So here's what's key. I had this thought. I was drinking my ice Americano this morning at Starbucks. And the Lord gave me this word. Here it is. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know what that means? It means you've walked through the ravine already. You know what that means? Everything in your past, God will use for his good and glory and your good in your life. Every bit of it. The hard things, the good things, the things that you think God can't use, God somehow uses. Always, always. And it's a fact. I can't promise you that your affliction will end. My brother, my sister, if you're watching online today, I can't promise you that you'll be healed in this world but I promise you, you will return to the house of the Lord. You will return. You will, you will. And one day there'll be no affliction. One day there'll be peace. I was telling my son, we were, we were watching, a, I, this is bonus. Pastor Mike, am I right? Like Heidman, Pastor Heidman never invite me back. Um, I was watching the Olympics with my kids, right? Trying to explain to how cool this was, right? And, um, it was the opening ceremony. They were singing, I can only imagine. You know what I'm talking about? The John Lennon song. Then I was teaching about John Lennon. I was teaching about the Beatles. I was really trying to help him really bad. And, um, and I said, I said, this is an amazing song. Listen to this song. And it was talking about peace and a world of peace. And I looked at my kids and I said, outside the kingdom of God, impossible. I said, what's crazy is people love that song. The thing that unites us is we love the hope of that song, amen? But the reality is, the truth is, 
until you know the God of Psalm 23, it's not possible. It's not possible. I can imagine it. I can imagine it when I read that. When I believe that. That he will use everything in my life. And one day, all affliction will be gone. And we'll stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. And listen, he'll look at your scars. You with me? I won't be running to Jesus. I'll be hobbling to Jesus. You know why? Because the affliction of this world. I'll be hobbling to Jesus. He'll show you his scars. He'll and listen. And he'll say, show me yours. And you'll say, thank you, Jesus. This made me somebody. This made me have influence and speak truth into people's lives. If I didn't know you, I wouldn't know you. Thank you for allowing me to walk through that and being faithful in the midst of the ravine. Because here, Jesus, it was just a shadow because I ain't dead. Eternity forever with you. That's the life of a Christian. Amen. Hey, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this word. It's powerful. Thank you, God, for this word. Lord Jesus, I pray in this room today. I didn't even do this in the first service, but I just want to do it. Is there anybody in the room? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just between you and Jesus. Say, dear Josh, Josh, Pastor Josh, Pastor Josh, I need Jesus in my life. I don't have a relationship with him like that. I need a relationship with him, not a religion. I need him in my life. Anybody just say, I need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have it. Anybody in the room? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? If that's you in the room, you say, I don't have a personal relationship like that, but I want it. Right now you say, dear Jesus, I want what you just told me. I want to know you like that. I need you to be the king of my life, the Lord of my life. I need to believe Psalm 23. Give me faith to believe that. And would you save me from me right now? Would you save me from being my king? Be my king. Be my Lord. And save me. Jesus, teach me to walk in you. I don't even know how to do it. Teach me to walk in you. I am yours and I surrender my life to you. If you prayed that prayer and you said, Jesus, I want you to be the king. It's the first time for you. I want you to come tell Pastor Mike. He's going to stand right up here in a second during this, this response. I want you to come tell him. I don't care how long you've been coming to walk church. If you said, I surrender my life, I've been my own king. But now he's my king. He's my shepherd. You come tell Pastor Mike. You need to tell somebody that. If you're here this morning, hey man in the room, say, Pastor Josh, did you pray for me? I'm struggling with affliction, addiction, something in my life right now that I feel like I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I feel like death. I'm struggling online right now. Put it in the chat. Would you pray for me? Just hands up all around this room. Amen. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, I pray Psalm 23 today. I pray Psalm 23 on Monday. I pray Psalm 23 on Tuesday. I pray it on Thursday, on Wednesday, on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday. I pray it every day in these people's lives. Now, Lord, their best days could be ahead. But Lord, is listen, they don't have the strength or the faith to do it every day. God, you have to give it to them. And so God, they're here purposely to hear from you, to be free from fear, to say, I'm a child of God and I trust you. And every day they wake up and they say, the Lord is my shepherd. How could I want, though I'm struggling through affliction, I may walk through the valley, but it's just a shadow. And I can trust that he will work all things in my life for my good and for his purposes. I believe that today, God, even if I don't see the outside, I know you're with me in the middle. And I believe that, and I have victory in that. And I will not walk in self-pity. I will walk in victory over that today, Lord. Thank you for freeing me today. And I'm gonna need free tomorrow, and I'm gonna need free the next day, because I'm gonna need you every day. And so Jesus, please speak this into my life every day. I trust you as my good shepherd. Thank you for loving me, despite of me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.